Spanning the globe, it's World the Bears Roundup. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents World Affairs Roundup, a monthly edition of International Focus, providing opinion and analysis of global events, with John Kotzka, a retired member of the U.S. Foreign Service, Anne Hamilton, political scientist at UW-Whitewater, who also served in the U.S. Foreign Service, and Robert Craig, executive director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin and author of articles and books on American foreign policy. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now, here's your moderator, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus and a slightly belated New Year's edition of our World Affairs Roundup. Ann Hamilton is on assignment, but our remaining Roundup regulars, John Kotzka and Robert Craig, are here with a political prospectus on a portfolio of world leaders and the global brands they represent. Whose stock is likely to rise this year and who's in for a bearish 2014? Rounding out our Roundup International Exchange are Russia, status as an essential player in Syria and Iran and a turn on the global stage as Olympic host would seem to position brand Russia for a good year. Where might the red ink on the balance sheet come from in the months ahead? Germany. Looking forward to four years before the next national election, Angela Merkel's Germany seems poised for quiet continuity. But as the Eurozone's economic woes persist, how will the tension between the continent's debtors and creditors impact Berlin? Iran. Following a decisive electoral victory and negotiated thaw with the West, Hassan Rouhani enters the new year on an upbeat note. With an economy in shambles, will this more concili conciliatory approach bring dividends in 2014? China. With significant reforms on the horizon under Xi Jinping, China watchers are split on where the world's second largest economy will go in 2014. Meanwhile, an increasingly muscular military stance has many in the region wary of the Chinese brand. And finally, the United States. With U.S. military and diplomatic interventions yielding few dividends, Rising competitors on the global stage and a sluggish economic growth back home, is Barack Obama's USA still a strong buy in 2014? Well, gentlemen, welcome back. The stock market is open, huh? The market <laughs> is open, and John, let's begin with you. Uh, just sort of a top-line question, was 2013 a good year for Putin's Russia? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, overall, they still have a uh, incredible amount of, uh, of resources that have come via the, uh, uh, the, the natural gas flow to Western Europe. Uh, he is they're building for the Olympics, which are about to happen. Uh, descent at home is very modest. Uh, it's only, only echoed because there is a coincidence of location. Most of the dissidents are in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and that's where the Western press is. So hmm. what about uh, Russia's year in the Middle East, Robert? T tell us a little bit how, uh, how they fared in, uh, in Syria and Iran, for example. Well, a lot of times power is at the margins. That is, if you can tip the balance, no matter how much power you have, then you can exercise influence. And they were able to broker this Syrian deal around the uh, chemical weapons, which uh, was, you know, really one of the first major foreign policy victories on the global stage in many years for Russia, and was embarrassing the United States. And so uh, they, they, I think they're going to be glorying in the afterlight of that victory for some time. And they also continue to play in a, an essential tipping role in other parts of the Middle East as well, and questions around the whole Iran nuclear issue, which we'll get to later in the program. And what about other expansion? I mean, there's, there are uh, sort of new interests in Africa and elsewhere? Uh, actually, I wasn't aware of, of African interests, but certainly they are attempting, while the U.S. remains somewhat uh, weakened, to uh, clear up the uh, situation with their, what they refer to as their near abroad, the, for, the former parts of the Soviet Union. Uh, a massive loan to the Ukraine to uh, to uh, cool any interest in Ukraine uh, developing a EU relationship. So, uh, what about one of one of one of your 
favorite gentleman, uh, Mr. Snowden, and the asylum. Well, how do we read that uh, as far as, as the Russian government's perception of where it can go and can't go vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.? It was tweaking the last remaining superpower, and so I think Putin enjoyed that, showing independence. And Ru in Russia still, it's greatly popular domestically to show Russia still a significant player on the stage. I don't know if they were able to get any secrets from him. It appears that most of it was left behind in Hong Kong from, uh, from, from what's being said, uh, but at least was another assertion of independence. His main problem, though, is, is that the country is so rank with corruption, so dependent upon natural resources, that's not exactly a dynamic economy. And as a result, that does limit their power. And until they have real reform internally, they can be a important, significant nation, but they're not going to rival China or the U.S. Robert makes, raises a good point. Where are the, what are the, what's the downside on Russia today? And there are probably three points that I bring up. One is that this ener energy cow uh, is now had calves, mm -hmm. and there's all sorts of opportunities for, for Europe, Western Europe, for example, to find uh, natural gas supply. So it's, it's lowering the price of the, of the goods and also the amount that, that the Western European countries would want to buy. The second thing is that their energy infrastructure is in, is in great need of repair and updating. Uh, and third, as Roger, uh, Robert was referring to, there is uh, Russia has a somewhat dysfunctional government and an economy, and that all sort of is a negative on where this is going for Russia. And so autocracy at many levels. So at this point, you know, we, we said at the top that 2013 was a, a good year for uh, for Mr. Putin. What about 2014? Well, I'm not going to buy any more stock. Okay, very good. Hold, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hold, uh, cautious hold. Well, let's, uh, let's move a, a bit further to the west and look at Germany. Uh, what about the nature of the new government? And we're, we, uh, we had a bit of a protracted period putting a go government together. Where, where did we end up on that? Well, we end up with Merkel still in control with an uneasy kind of coalition alliance, right? Uh, it doesn't seem to, be, to, to indicate any major change in policy, especially in foreign policy, if there's any change at all, and it's domestic. And so, but it's a very stolid regime in terms of its foreign policy in many ways. It simply wants to make sure there's not any deal that undermines creditors, Germany, and makes them bail out Southern Europe within the EU. And it doesn't seem to have many ambitions. In fact, the economy is so strong, it's doing so generally well, uh, that it simply wants to, things are fine, right? And it doesn't want any major changes, per se. Uh, it wants to keep the EU together, uh, but that's a very uneasy alliance, because it's not only to do anything major to help the, uh, the, the other countries in Southern Europe, because quite frankly, the German attitude is, is that they got into this mess of their own accord by lack of virtue and lack of hard work, et cetera, and that they should work their way out of it. The way you look at Germany and Merkel is there are two different points of view. If you think that the EU is on the mend and improving, then you give a positive mm -hmm. endorsement to both. If you, if you think that there is more bad news to come, then Germany has more bad news to, to absorb as well. Right. And they, they were really caught between the fact that, there, that the a rising number of the electorate are unhappy with the fact that they're bailing out the pigs, as they're called. Mm -hmm. Portugal, Italy, Greece, Greece uh, uh, Ireland, and Spain. Spain, the S of the pigs, yes. yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the other part of it is their economy is doing so well because of all the money that these these particular countries were buying German goods and also the, all the loans that they absorbed from Germany. So they're caught between a, hard, a rock and a hard place on that one. So uh, you know, where do we see Germany going within that, that EU framework? I mean, uh, do you think the average German voter much cares about you know being being the first among equals within the EU, or do they just want to be left alone to enjoy their healthy economy? I think they want to be left alone, but they most aren't. people want to be left alone. <laughs> but they don't. They they want to keep the EU together, but they don't want to change the fundamental bargain, and they're not certainly not willing to do anything to try to say 
uh, help these other countries, even though, as John pointed out, what's going to may end up happening is they, they may actually cut their own markets, and, uh, and, and so it may damage them long term. But it, it's almost like an ethical issue for them that these countries are irresponsible at some level. There's a real problem with the EU, which is fundamental, which is most countries can control their currency. And so them all being stuck in the same currency is very problematic when you have such a different levels of economic development. Sure. Well, I would watch the French relationship as a marker for where this is going. Uh, France representing the soft underbelly of the EU, Germany, the stronger currencies. And they had a very strong relationship with Sarkozy, but who knows where this is going now. Okay. Exit question, buy, sell, or hold on, uh, on your German position? I'm not buying any more stock. No. I think it's blue, blue chip stock, and I think if you like dividend producing stock, even if it doesn't grow very quickly, then it's a, a good investment. I still think there's another <laughs> shoe to drop in Europe. Well, let's, uh, <laughs> let's head to another continent and look at Iran. Uh, I think it would be hard to argue that 2013, on the diplomatic front at least, was, was not a good year for uh, the new government. But, Robert, talk a little bit about where their economy is right now and, and how that might be driving some of the, the thaw. Well, it's in a shambles. The inflation rate is outrageous. And so there's a, a lot of popular despair about this. And so there's a, a real desire to get out from out of these sanctions. And you could certainly argue that the national pride behind having a nuclear program, even though it's denied to be for weapons, is beginning to succumb a bit to the reality of what it does to the regime and to the people to have these sanctions. So, I mean, to those who believe sanctions never work, right. this may be evidence that sanctions can that. be yeah. extremely effective. Uh, the issue is, is that the United States and Europe are much more eager to jump upon this opening in the six months agreement than uh, Likud and Israel. And so it's actually created a division uh, within the United States and between U.S. and Israel over this. But uh, to, to Europe and the United States, it, it seems like a no brainer to move forward and try to defuse the nuclear situation. Well, John, you know, we've, we've got a six month deal, which is already uh, partially expired. Uh, is there a danger for the regime with the rising expectations? I mean, it, it's not as if a deal has been done and the sanctions are well, the imminently... Ha the deal hasn't been done exactly. yet. Exactly. So, so what happens when six months down the road things aren't uh, reversed and the price of sugar continues to go up? Uh, there, is no, there is no guarantee that it's going to get that far. There is strong opposition within Iran amongst the Revolutionary Guard, amongst some of the more radical clerics, to, the, to this rapprochement with the, with the West. Uh, uh, Khomeini uh, just came out uh, and, and said that the U.S. had exposed its, its very anti-Iranian position in the talks. Uh, there are some serious questions about some uh, centrifuges that they want to put in, a new generation of them which many feel are contrary to the spirit of this thing. So I'm not sure that there, this is moving forward. On the U.S. side, we have serious opposition. Yep. Uh, there is the Israeli lobby that is against mm -hmm. this. There is the Saudi lobby that is against this. This puts the United States into a very interesting... Yeah, uh, it's the hawks in the Senate, too. And the hawks in the Senate. <laughs> so, well, we'll... Uh... We'll hold off on our major purchase of uh, Iranian shares at this point, but uh, first we'll take a short break and then move on to, to other portfolio positions. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're talking with John Katsuka and Robert Craig. Well, let's move on to China as our uh, next issue in our portfolio. China was uh, in the process of sort of an Asian charm offensive and, and trying to appear less scary and, uh, and 
uh, muscular. How does that stand right now? It's very strange. I mean, they're being charming all the way around, trying to rebuild relationships, even with Japan, right? Having nice cocktail parties back and forth with you know, delegations of dignitaries. And then they suddenly and clumsily declare a no-fly zone, uh, which uh, intersects with Korea's and goes over a couple disputed islands that Japan has purchased. And it just undermines everything, scares the heck out of all the ASEAN nations, who happen to mean Japan at the time, of course, freaks out Japan as well. And so there's actually theory out there that one, that the leadership of China wasn't necessarily for this, that the hardline part of the People's Liberation Army was able to impose this in some way over the objections of the, of the leaders of the country and the party, which is very interesting. I don't know how to verify that, but it, it, you, you're, you're driven to such explanations when the behavior is so inconsistent. When you have a new leader, Xi Jinping, and he is just taking power. There is always that little interregnum that occurs where there's a competition. And we keep thinking about the China, and, and we used to think of the Soviet Union as this monolith. There is, there are enormous, there is enormous competition amongst various factors in there. Mm -hmm. This is actually the ADIZ, the Air Defense Identification Zone is an extension of the competition that has been going on for a few years now over the South China Sea. And at the bottom of this, I, as, as I understand it, there's energy. There's oil down there. Mm -hmm. So this is laying down some stakes. Now, this was clumsily done. Uh, to get South Korea and Japan talking about mutual interests, uh, you had to work hard to get that to arrive at that, con that condition. So uh, it is unlikely that they are going to back off of this because face is an important thing in that part of the world. But what is probably true is that there is going to be an increasingly less uh, notice, net less enforcement of, the, of, of this identification. Well, irrespective of, of this new uh, muscle flexing on the military side, Robert, how are things going in uh, economic terms? Well, it's interesting. I mean, they have quite put everything into building exports and, and having a very uh, high economic growth. And they have, in many ways, repressed uh, d d domestic wages, frankly. And so it's created a huge amount of debt. In fact, some people think it's even a debt bubble along the lines of what happened in the United States. It's different. It's not about housing sprawl and, and people well, are subprime mortgages. in some ways it is a But it's not about mortgage instruments right. per se right. and, and, and exotic financial instruments, speaking of our financial theme uh, in the show. Uh, and so there's a question of how much longer they can do that without causing unrest. And there's a surprising amount of unrest as far as the number of civil disturbances that take place in China. You don't usually see it in the headlines here, but it is a, a very unstable place in some respects specs, and that's why the Middle Kingdom has always wanted to maintain stability. And so it's less uh, obvious that, they're, that they have this straight-up growth trajectory than, than most people believe, that there, there are some issues with how the economy is structured. And they, they still have this coastal versus in, interior issue. Uh, the, the coast is where the success, the, the, the driving engine for the, this new economy, the, the interior is, is back in another century. Uh, trying to get a, some, some, some movement of that is one of the goals of the reforms that uh, Xi Jinping is, has been promoting. But that is not easy. They have an entrenched bureaucracy, and some of the trials that we have seen and some of the executions are a result of, of you know, when you have uh, a, this communist bureaucracy that has been given access to enormous sums of money, we see what happens. Well, I want to leave enough time to uh, return home, and uh, let me ask sort of the, the top-line question on the U.S., was 2013, as some people have portrayed it, a lost year for the U.S. and the Obama administration? I would say it wasn't a good year. Uh, I, we, we stumbled into negotiations with Iran. The Soviet, the, not the Soviet, the Russians gave us that one. Mm -hmm. uh, we are clumsily leaving Afghanistan. The legacy of Iraq is still haunting. Uh, 
we were supposed to be making a shift to Asia. We haven't done that yet. We have a Secretary of State that's still preoccupied with the Middle East peace process. How that's going to occur when mm -hmm. we have a, a, a Saudi, a, a Sunni Shia conflict going on, I have no idea. And we have an Israel, an Israeli ally that is very unhappy. So, uh, to what extent does the domestic political dysfunction play into this, Robert? I think it plays into it a lot. I mean, it, it's unclear what our foreign policy is other than to pull back from the Bush foreign policy from the mistakes of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, without much to show for it. Um, but there's this kind of haunting sense that then there's all this ink being spilled about the country being in decline. And so the domestic kind of gridlock is part of that, right? And so it gives you a question as to how you can have this forward military posture when you have dip, when you have crises around funding the government that come up constantly and complete gridlock between conservatives who control the House of Representatives and Democrats in the White House and the Senate. And so it just it just adds to the sense, and I think it really impacts the country's reputation nation, internationally. And so it, it's reduced the prestige of the country in a lot of ways. It makes it looks like the country is in decline, even though it's still the largest economy by far in the world, and even though it still has uh, tremendous assets in the global stage and economically, if you if you if you look at it objectively, but there's this sense of failure, this sense of um, uh, of the country somehow coming apart. I see it more in strategic terms. Uh, the White House has been captured by a group that is very much in favor of a philosophy called R2P, responsibility to protect. And it has become the driver as opposed to one of the components of our foreign policy. Uh, I would hope that in the, I would be willing to buy some shares if there was a, a slightly more realistic, pragmatic approach to foreign affairs in, the, uh, in 2014. So is there a, a particular part of the world, do you think, where, where the, the reputation has really suffered the most? I mean, were there any any perceived gaffes that really undermine credibility more than somewhere else? The Middle East. Yeah, I have the same reaction. Middle yeah. East, uh, our, our relationship also with uh, Pakistan is, is troubled and not improving. And um, our relationship with India right now is, although that one is, is, is more of a, over a personnel issue, the, the deputy consul of the New York consulate was apparently did some things that were illegal in the United States and was caught. Well, so uh, what about the positives? I mean, what uh, you, you mentioned, you know, I think uh, China's economy, which is number two, is still roughly half mm -hmm. of, of the U.S. economy. What, what are some of the other things on the plus side of the ledger? On the plus side, there, it's, it's relativity. As I think you refer to it, we're doing, our economy is doing better than. It is not right. doing as well as it was, but it's doing better. Our political system is more secure, more stable than. Uh, it is not necessarily wonderful, but I, I think it's a, it's, it's a issue of relativity. I think the ideological division in the U.S. is a real problem because it is new in the sense that you have I mean, it used to be with the party competition in the country that there was a pragmatist part of each party that kind of made major decisions, and that has been that has been removed from the from with the, with really the far right's takeover of the Republican Party here, and that has implications for foreign policy as well. That as, as well as the far left of the Democratic Party. Well, I I would like to see that actually, but it's not happened. That's that, that's that. I mean, if you if you're it taking an objective your point of view, <laughs> you take an objective standpoint. The if you look at Democrats in the Senate, they're, they're, uh, the, the leadership is a fairly pragmatic group, relatively speaking. So, no, I think that, no, I'm not trying to make an ideological point. I'm saying that I think that the rise of the American right over the last 30 years is a major historical fact that affects the whole world, that affects the United States. And so the, it does, when you have the checks and balances the Founding Fathers set up, create opportunities for tremendous gridlock. 
And so you're literally having discussions of whether we can afford basic things like Medicare and Social Security at the same time that we that, that people are advocating for a more forward force posture and more more aggress aggressiveness around the world. So it's it's a very strange situation. It's hard to see how this country is good, the, the, the world's oldest mass democracy is going to develop. I think it's a major question for the United States and for the whole world. Well, uh, just sort of the, the exit question here then. Uh, is, is the U.S. still the indispensable power? I mean, is there anybody on the horizon that could fulfill some of these roles? No, there is no one else that can do these roles right now. The question is, how many of those roles should the U.S. do, and for what, for what reason, and what, and what is the strategy when you do it? That's right. Indispensable for what, right, is the question. And so I, it's sort of, there's sort of a... Uh, a uh, kind of inertia where we're going to do everything that we chose to do after World War II. Some of it is no longer relevant. Um, some of it, it probably shouldn't be done at all, and there are crucial things we're, we're not doing, right? And so I, I really think that some of our military base posture around the world is to, to take a domestic standpoint out there to protect outsourcing by U.S. corporations to developing economies. That's in the interest of some people, but it, it, I think there'll be a backlash against that in the United States moving forward. Well, up to that point, we were, Robert and I were pretty much in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to leave it at that to our viewers. Look forward to talking to your broker and seeing you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.